Either he is or he's a liar. He's always there. So Lord, as we come to you tonight, we're coming to you knowing you're the God that's there. You're the God that hears. You're the God who's going to make sure we're going to make it. You're the God that puts us on other people's hearts so that they're praying for us. You're the God who speaks to our hearts to fight the battle for others when they're so heavy on our heart and mind that, Father, we're just reminded, I need to stop right now and pray for them. You are the God who meets every need according to our benefit but for your glory. So, Lord, we come boldly to lay all of these needs at your feet, Lord. Hospitals, doctors, sickness and surgery, death, fear, worry, and panic. Lord, we leave it all in your hands right now because you're the God who meets the need, and we are not. I thank you, Lord, for being with us. I thank you that from time to time you allow us to run into a Goliath. From time to time, you allow us to be swallowed by the whale. Knowing we're safe. You you know that we're safer than we do. You know we're protected and everything's going to be all right. We don't. But what it does help us with is to draw closer to you. Lord, I need you. And every one of us in this room needs you. Thank you, Lord God, because you protect us from the attacks of the evil one. You are the one who sustains us and holds us. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Is that where my help comes from? No, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of not just the hill, the maker of heaven and earth. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. And thank you, Lord, that all of these needs are yes and amen in you right now. Be with our youth, our children, be with all the stuff, all the different things that are going on on the campus tonight. And Father, may you be high and lifted up and glorified in it. And Father, let us leave here today glad we one more time went to church on a Wednesday night. And Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Turn with me to the book of Numbers. We're going. I'm going to take you somewhere really weird. Because Pastor Mike is your pastor. Hallelujah. I'm going, to sh- I'm going to show you something that blew my mind, and maybe it'll blow yours. Uh, let me look and see if we got anything major coming up. This coming Sunday is Father's Day. Father's Day. And we're going to have a special gift uh, for the dads. Come on out. We'll have a little something for you. And uh, but we're going to be celebrating Dad uh, this coming Sunday. And um, <laughs> there is no quilting Thursday, uh, no quilting tomorrow, but we do have game night. We have game night. She said she wasn't. Correction, we are having quilting. There you go. So thank you, Mary Jo. Good to have Mary Jo with us. All right, so we are having Quilting Thursday. We are having game night Friday. And uh, some of y'all need to come out and experience that. That's a hoot, man. And uh, have a good time, a lot of good food. We are having our, uh, uh, summer, uh, our, our summertime change. We're doing it for the summer as an experiment because we just want to try something out, okay? So Sunday school at 930, service at 1030. We get out and beat the Baptist to the chicken. Praise God. <laughs> And uh, but we're gonna try it just see what happens. Sunday school teachers, I know I got confronted with this. Hey, Sunday school teachers, we're changing Sunday school times. I forgot to mention that to all of our Sunday school teachers, so yeah, that might be important, you know. But uh, uh, we are, we are, and again, it's an experiment because it's, it's an experiment with a purpose and uh, for later down the road, but. We're going to see, see how it works. If we like it, great. If we don't like it, that's fine. No griping. Starts the 30th. Starts the 30th. No griping. No grouchiness. Weather through it. Come on, if you could survive four years of a certain president. Okay. 
Don't whine about two months of having to get to church a little early. Okay? So I'm just saying, just saying. Uh, so, yeah, that starts uh, the 30th. On uh, July the 7th, we're having Jimmy Buffett Sunday. So we're, we're going to have a, a hamburgers and hot dogs here. We're going to have a fellowship time here. We're going to have service. Uh, 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 everything's geared around. Wear your tropical shirts. Wear that stuff. And because uh, Pastor Mike's probably not going to get to go to the ocean this year. <laughs> this is as close as it's going to get. So y'all, y'all, no, we don't have Jimmy Buffett worship songs. I did. We're not, we're not doing it. Uh, Kogo, you got any in your back pocket? You can. Uh, all right, just, just let let Todd know if you can come up with something that might work. But uh, yes, sir. What, what was that? Jimmy July seventh, first Sunday in July. First Sunday, we're going to have a baby dedication that day. So I told the parents, I said, you got to put them in Hawaiian stuff or shark, okay, <laughs> or shark. So that that that's doable. Um, I had somebody's. I, I had. I'm not going to mention any names, but somebody was saying Jimmy Buffett Sunday. Is that like you know, margarita machine or something at the church? Praying for you. Praying for you. We might have pineapple slushies, <laughs> but we. <laughs> but they they will be spirit free. Hallelujah. So um, we do uh, again need help with our kids uh, uh we're going to have a list on sunday uh, uh some uh some needs we have to help out with our kids ministries because we got listen we got a lot of kids coming and that's a good problem but it still creates some problems and so we just need people to help us out with uh helping out with the kids so we'll have more information on that sunday last thing is we have a uh rodeo committee we're needing to do a church rodeo committee for some rodeo things we got going on with play days coming up and uh um, i can't do it by myself i need a team to help me and um, uh, this will be focusing on the the 2025 uh, year um it'll probably start like in spring and go through the summer something like that but there's also ranch rodeo things which would be stuff that adults can do and uh, um, so I'm actually meeting with some cowboy churches this coming Sunday to help plan some of that stuff and see what we might be able to be a part of. But I need a rodeo committee. And uh, we will be using the, uh, as of right now, we'll be using our arena because we don't have one. Our arena will be the Colleen Arena. I've already talked with Mike Adamson about that, and we're working out the details on it. If you'd be interested in that and uh, helping out, helping some kids, Get into rodeo because, have you know, we're a cowboy church. Did you know you're in a cowboy church? I didn't. Okay. Yeah, it just kind of got that glazed look. I don't know where I'm at. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that, let me know and uh, uh, shoot me a text. I've already gotten a couple that said, yeah, I would like to be a part of that. So I think it's exciting and uh, uh, to be a part of reaching people however, however we can, however we can. So, Numbers chapter 22. Um, we do have, uh, let me say this, we will, uh, starting in July, we have one small group that will be meeting. I'll be here in the sanctuary. We do have one small group that will be meeting in, that is July, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, just stay with me here, help me. Uh, Brother Todd Chafin will be doing a study on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And uh, it's a Tony Evans study. And uh, love, 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 love that guy. Uh, incredible. And uh, so that, that'll be one going on on Wednesday nights, July and August. Uh, I'm looking at what we'll be doing here at the sanctuary. Um, but one I was going to teach the last quarter, and I didn't, I didn't get around to getting it done. Uh, actually, I was going to teach it when I went to Africa. Was uh, something that's a little pertinent for us where we live today in the times we live in. And uh, kind of like we looked at the seven churches of um, Revelation and how a lot of that speaks to the time frame we're in right now. Uh, looking at doing a deep dive on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And um, you can say, well, that, that doesn't sound very good. Listen, I'm telling you, it's, it's pretty intense. This is a deep dive. And uh, so it's like, hey, you all know the announcements? Good. We're getting right into it because you're going to drink out of a fire hose 
There's a lot of information on it, but a lot of it deals with, again, remember, that stuff was the prelude to Jesus Christ coming back. And you're going to find out that it, you know the rise of the Antichrist isn't just going to happen. It's being prepared right now. And so there's stuff you're going to find out. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, that stuff, it's already happening now. And uh, so it's not a matter of, of uh, well, they're going to, the devil's going to get ready. No, he's already ready. How do you know we should be already ready? And so there's, there's some stuff on that. So, yeah. I saw that look you gave me. <laughs> Balaam and his talking donkey. I remember that story. Wasn't that the coolest as a kid? That was just like, wow, talking donkeys. And uh, I loved it. But the fuller story is even more overwhelming when you look at Balaam. I'm not going to talk about his talking donkey. That's a, that's a, that's a whole other one. But uh, uh, I want to look at Balaam's story. Then, and, and in this, here's what I want you to see. The Bible is full of a ton of incredible nuggets that you have to dig for. You have to look for. You have to research it. Otherwise, you it, the Bible goes in this eye and out that one. You you know, it just kind of sails right over your head. And we just think, especially Book of Numbers. I can't stand a Book of Numbers. It's a census. It's a Census Bureau report. And there's a few stories that's in there. But man, you start off the beginning of the year. Genesis. Woo! That was pretty good. Then you know. Exodus, yeah, that was pretty good. You get to numbers and it's like, you know, you just kind of break down in the middle of a bog. And But uh, there's even in the midst of that stuff that seems like, man, that's not very meaningful at all. You miss the significance of God's word if we're not paying attention. And I want to show you something that, that I found years ago that uh, uh, is pretty mind-blowing. Uh, Numbers chapter 22, starting in verse number 1, says this, Then the people of Israel traveled to the plains of Moab, camped east of the Jordan River, across from Jericho. Balak, the son of Zippor, the uh, Moabite king, had seen everything the Israelites did to the Amorites. And when the people of Moab saw how many Israelites there were, they were terrified. The king of Moab said to the elders of Midian, The mob will devour everything in sight like an ox devours the grass in the field. I was actually going to read this out of my pirate Bible just to give you a taste of that. I, it was so funny, but I just didn't have time. So y'all need to get one of those. Incredible. So Balak, king of Moab, sent messengers to call Balaam, son of Beor, who was living in the native land of Pethor uh, near the Euphrates River. His message said this, Look, a vast horde of people have arrived from Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and they are threatening me. Please come and curse these people for me because they are too powerful me. For me, then perhaps I will be able to conquer them and drive them from the land. I know that the blessings fall on any that you bless, and the curses fall on people that you curse. Balak's messengers, who were elders of Moab and Midian, set out with the money to pay Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. They went to Balaam and delivered Balak's message to him. Stay here overnight, Balaam said. In the morning I will tell you whatever the Lord directs me to say. So the officials from Moab stayed there with Balaam. That night, God came to Balaam and, and asked him, Who are these men visiting you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me this message. Look, a vast horde of people have arrived from Egypt. They cover the face of the earth. Come and curse these people for me. Then perhaps I'll be able to stand up to them and drive them from the land. But God told Balaam, Do not go with them. Do not go with them. You are not to curse these people, for they are what? They're what? Blessed. They're blessed. And it's interesting how many people think of Balaam as a godly prophet. He is not. Number one, a godly prophet is not a prophet for hire. Okay. Secondly, a godly prophet is not running around cursing people. Third, everybody knows this is Israel. Everybody knows this is Israel. It's a million people left Egypt. Everybody knows this is Israel. And he felt comfortable to call Balaam 
to curse Israel. And what does Balaam say? Hmm, let me see. Balaam was not a godly man. I want you to get that. Okay? And you'll find out later if you read the story, he's not a godly man because when this doesn't work, he gives Balak another way to trap the Israelites. Now we're going to skip to verse 20 and it says this. Because he came to God again. That night God came to Balaam and told him, Since these men have come for you, get up and go with them, but only do what I tell you to do. So the next morning Balaam got up, saddled his donkey, and started off with the Moabite officials. Balak, the king of Moab, uh, uh, is so afraid of Israel that he sends for this pagan prophet to come curse Israel. It's a 400 mile trip. The, the, the kingdom of, of Moab is right around what we know of as Jor, uh, Jordan on the uh, east side of the Dead Sea. And uh, uh, that's where Moab is. And of course, you can see Mesopotamia up in, up in that green region. That's up in there is where um, Balaam is. And it's about a 400-mile trip uh, one way. It's a one-month journey. And reading this story, this happens at least twice. He sends them away, then they turn around and come back to him. And so there's a lot of time invested in this trip. Now as you read the next chapter in 23, you see that Balak, uh, uh, when, when Balaam shows up, Balak takes Balaam up on one hillside and says, uh, now curse him. And he goes up on that one hillside, and, and those of you that know the story, he looks out there, sees Israel, and instead of cursing them, God gives him a word to say. Can God speak through an ungodly prophet? He can speak through a donkey. Yes, he can speak through an ungodly prophet. God forbid that God today would need to use the ungodly to speak his word because the godly could not stand up and do it for him. Somebody hearing me. So he takes him up. Blesses Israel. That's not what I paid you to do. Takes him another place. Curse him. He blesses Israel. That's not what I paid you to do. Three times he took him to three different hillsides. He stands up there and says, Look, I can only tell what God tells me to say. And he blesses Israel instead of curses them. And the question is why? Why? Why could he not curse Israel? Remember what God said. Only say the things that I tell you to say. What was it that was preventing Balaam from cursing Israel? To answer that, we need a little more information regarding the Israelites as they were traveling through the land at the time. They left Egypt. They're roaming around in the wilderness uh, uh, waiting for the right time to get into the promised land. Now, Numbers chapter 1, they take a census of all the fighting men that are in Israel's uh, uh, encampment there. Uh, chapter 2 describes the tribal encampment order, meaning, okay, all the tribe of Dan, you camp here. It literally lays out, you got your tabernacle, and this is where these tribes are going to uh, uh, park your RVs here, these tribes are going to park your RVs here, you know. And so it's, because it, I mean, you know, with God there's order. That's why some people say God's a woman, because <laughs> a man can't do that. That's terrible. Terrible. So he lays it all out. And at the center of the camp, at the very center, is the tabernacle. And, uh, and the front of the tabernacle always faces east. It always had to. Wherever they were prowling around, you make sure the front of that thing points east. Okay. And so you have Moses and Aaron, the priests, that are always stationed at the front. They, they, they make their bed at the front of the tabernacle. You read uh, uh, in, in chapter 2 of Numbers, it talks about the Kohathites, the Gershonites, the Merorites, all these ites that, that are they're not necessarily part of the priesthood, but they're part of the priesthood. They're allowed to stay inside this encampment. And, uh, uh, and, and so that's, that's where they are. Now the remaining tribes were assigned together uh, in groups. And uh, so like on that east side you have the tribe of Issachar, Judah, Zebulun. Uh, to the south you have Simeon, Reuben, Gad, uh, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh. To the north, Naphtali, Dan, and Asher. All 12 of the tribes uh, right there. Now Ephraim, Manasseh for the extra uh, 
biblical nerds in here, Levi and Joseph are not named because Ephraim and Manasseh uh, takes their place. Levi is the priest. So they do not actually get a part of the twelve. Why? Because God is their part. Everybody else gets land. Everybody else gets substance. But not the Levites. Why? Because they belong to God. If you want to take a good look at the role of the pastor and the minister, go back and reread that and you find out how much that, that the idea of a full-time minister was God's idea. It really was. Because when a pastor has to go work, he doesn't have the time to take care of you spiritually. There's a, there's a deep... Pastors, we get it. and It's just like, oh, I'm special. I'm needed, you know. Everybody else says, Psh, go get a job. So you look at these different areas where they had to camp. And... Uh, and the, uh, each tribe had a tribal standard which was in accordance to the constellations of the Maseroth. That is the Hebrew zodiac. The, you know, uh, you have like Naphtali was uh, Capricornus. Uh, Dan was the eagle. Asher was Sagittarius. Uh, you had all these different ones, but they rallied around one major one. So look to the west up at the top, and, uh, and you've got Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Ephraim was was the one standard that the other two came underneath. So they were under the banner of Ephraim. Uh, to the south, Simeon, Reuben, Gad. And so Simeon and Gad rallied under Reuben. Reuben was like the head of that side. Okay, So you had all these, but they all rallied around one banner. The other two were what you consider minor banners. Now these camps could only be as wide as the priestly camp. Okay, so however wide that, that square is right there, that's how wide that, that they had to stay in. And they had to stay in their encampment in that area because it was to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. Not to the north, northeast. Not to the southwest. You had to stay in your lane. Why? Because if you look at God, God was a God of order. God liked things pure. He liked things separate. He liked things not to be all merged and we don't know uh, who you're from, where are you at. No, you stayed with your tribe. Go back and re-look at some of the things that the tribes had to do. If you belong to a tribe, you're a woman, you belong to a certain tribe, you had to marry a man from that tribe. That's just how it was done. Uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, man, you're, you're out of your tribe. You need to stay in your tribe. And so God kept things in orderly fashions, and so this is part of it. And so they camped in this, in this fashion, however wide that the, that the priest made that encampment around the tabernacle, that's the, perif the perimeter that they stayed with. Now, when you add up the census figures for the fighting men that were here, this is kind of interesting. So like the camp of Reuben, uh, when you add those three together, you had 151,400 men. Uh, the camp of Ephraim, those three together, you had 108,000. Now the camp of, of uh, Judah. Camp of Judah was interesting because Judah by far had the most out of any of the tribes. They had the largest tribe in their encampment. But guess what? They also had the smallest tribe in their encampment. If, has anybody in here ever studied Issachar in the Bible? There's a place where there's a place in where right as um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is dying, and he pulls his children together. They're in Egypt. Okay, they're in Egypt. He's dying. He pulls his sons together, and he begins to call them out. And he, as he calls them out. He says, hey, hey, uh, um, uh, who was that? Ephraim. Hey, Ephraim, you're a bull. It's interesting. He gives each one of these the sign. He names each one of these by their uh, Maseroth sign. And he speaks a prophecy over them which would entail their entire tribe. It's pretty interesting when he does that. And when he gets to Issachar, he says something about them that's very, very... They're the smallest tribe of all. They were the brain trust 
of Israel. Because it says they alone knew the times and the seasons and the way Israel should move and lead. It's interesting that the smallest was not the most insignificant. Hmm, sounds like a sermon got preached here Sunday. The smallest is not the most insignificant. As a matter of fact, the smallest was probably one of the most powerful because that was the brain trust of them all. So you look at this, and out of the four different parameters, uh, there's the census of all the fighting men. Now, 100... Uh, 200, 300, 400, that's over half a million right there. Now you times it by three or four because I even know these guys had wives and kids. A lot of them have wives and kids. So it's easy. You have at least one million people tracking around the wilderness. Can you imagine being Moses? Leading a million people through the wilderness? Mr. Mayor. What's your population of your community? 1,600. And that's probably about 1,400 too many. <laughs> 1,600 people. I, would, I, was a, I was a city councilman for a town of 290. Pain in the rear. Can we say that in Cowboy Church? Yes, we can. Can you imagine being the governor, being the mayor of over a million people? Man. Yet God made Moses do that. So he had this ton of people moving around and, and uh, uh, powerful. Now, let's, let's, let me do this here. So when you take the numbers that you see, and then you place them at their compass points where they need to be. According to the specific standards, like these four right here, you put them according to those. This is what Balaam saw when he looked down from the mountaintop. Go to that next one, brother. What are you seeing? Come on. When he stood on the mountaintop and looked down, this is how Israel was encamped. And when he stood up there, he couldn't. Why? Because you can't curse the picture of God's grace. It's fascinating. And what's even more fascinating is when you look at this, Reuben is, a, is the man, Ephraim is the ox, Dan is the eagle, Judah is the lion. Look at those four faces right there. Man, ox, eagle, lion. What being in the Bible has four faces of the man, the ox, the eagle, and the lion? The cherubim. The cherubim angels. And the cherubim angels in heaven, surround what? The throne of God. And they attend to the Lord day and night and cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isn't it interesting that the four faces of the cherubim are surrounding something? What are they surrounding? The tabernacle, which was God's throne on earth earth you can't curse that because it's the presence of God it's the very picture of who God is and what he's doing among mankind and I looked at that when I studied this Dr. Chuck Missler was really blew my mind showing me this and I realized there's power in the cross you know and I, I grew up watching the movies Vampires stay back, you know, and you point the cross at them, and you know, the cross drives out the unholy things. The cross is powerful. Why? Because it's the picture of God's love for you, it's the picture of Jesus' love for you. Mark chapter 
8. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. Jesus called the crowd to join his disciples. He said, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you've got to give up your own way and what? Take up your cross. You've got to take up your cross and follow me. If you hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And I look at that in, in, in Pastor Ben, when, when he pastored, this is something we preach and we say, yeah, the cross is your sacrifice. You've got to lay down your life and you've got to take up your cross. And that, that literally is a picture of sacrifice because you're not carrying yourself around, now you're carrying Him around. It's not about what I want, it's about what He wants. But it's more than a picture of sacrifice. What if it was a picture of protection? Because thousands of years before Jesus was ever born, the cross was already at work. Consider that. Thousands of years before crucifixion was ever invented. Are you hearing me? Before a cross was ever invented to crucify somebody on, God was already using it. I don't know about you, but that, that blows my mind. But you know what blows my mind even more? How much of this we don't know. How many of you have never heard that before? You've never seen that? Okay. Do you know it's been in here the whole time? It's been in here the whole time. I didn't know it until it was shown to me. And it's one of those things that just, man, I'll never forget. It stirred something in me. In the, one of the, in the middle of one of the most boring books of the Bible was this powerful picture of God at work. Suddenly, the Bible's not so boring. What's boring? Mike Sullivan's boring. Thank you for that, Amen. <laughs> Thank you for that. No soup for you. We make church boring. Crying out loud. We make God boring. And God's anything but boring. Oh man, He pulls a rabbit out of a hat like that. And I want to call God boring. No, He's not boring. Maybe I just think too little of Him. Maybe I'm not thinking enough of Him. Maybe I spent too much time thinking about this versus that. Amen. It's kind of like being married. The longer you're married, the more you take each other for granted. The longer you're married, the less special your partner can be to you if you're not careful. Am I right? And you forget that person was so wonderful and incredible. I couldn't imagine not spending another day with them. And now, 40 years later, I don't know how I can spend one more hour with them. We forget the romance. We forget the mystery. We forget the beauty of the relationship. And it happens between us and God. It happens between us and God's Word. And listen, I'm, before I can preach this sermon to you, i got to preach it to myself. Because I get caught up in the stuff. I get caught up in the stuff. The stuff of life. The stuff of ministry. The stuff of being a husband. The stuff of being a dad. I get caught up in the stuff and I forget just how special God is. And that this God, this God, travels with me in my truck wherever I go. And He's the, he's the quiet passenger in my vehicle. 
He's the quiet friend in the recliner beside me who's waiting for me to stop and say, hey, can we talk? Hey, can you give me wisdom? Hey, Lord, what's going on? I can't tell you the times when I have come back around and say, hey, God, I, I, I need your presence. Tell me something. And then the Lord begins just speaking. And the mind begins growing. The heart begins enlarging. And I'm like, man, why have I not been spending all this time with him? Is anybody understanding? Is this relating with anyone? I want you to go have a good vacation at some point this summer. Even if it's to still house. Go down there and look at the water. Hallelujah. They're not bailing hay anymore at the at the lake. <laughs> I want you to be able to get away and have some time. I want you to go visit your family. I want you to, to in this season, find some rest. But don't forget God. And I know you're here on a Wednesday night, but I'll say it anyway, for maybe for those on watching the camera. Don't forget church. Because we're better together. Yes. We're better together. I really believe that. Take that time to be with God. Take that time to be with your family. Because I just believe there's some beautiful things that God wants to reveal to you that you have never seen. And I, I don't want I don't know. I don't want to stand in heaven and look at everything I missed and say, doggone it. I had all this available that could have been mind-blowing. I wish I could have learned it then. I wish I could have learned it then. God, I thank you. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your patience because, Lord, you, we get busy. I am a firm believer that the devil can't make us bad. He'll make us busy. If we're not going to reject God, then we'll at least be too busy to be with God. Even as we do God's things. And Father, I pray that we are a busy church. We do a lot of stuff. But Lord, I pray, help us here at Maxdale never to compromise in our time with you and in your word. Lord, I, I pray for me. I pray for me first. Help me to be in your presence and be in your word. Help us as a church body to be in your presence and be in your word. Every time we come together, Lord God, help us to be in your presence and be in your word. And Father, I pray that you would help us to remember if God is for me, who can be against me? And as the cross is applied to my life, ain't no devil in hell can curse me. I am blessed and not cursed. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It doesn't mean it won't form. It doesn't even mean it might not hurt. But it will not have victory over me. And Father, I thank you for that promise that somebody needs to hear tonight. Watch over us and keep us, Lord, because the safest place we could be is in the palm of your hand, even if we're in the belly of the whale or standing before a giant or in a pit of hungry lions. I am safer there in your hands than out on Main Street by myself. Father, I thank you. And Lord, we give you the glory. Watch over us. Get us all home safely tonight. Help us to represent, Lord, be ambassadors of you, wherever we go this week. And Lord, use us to shine light and to see hearts impacted for eternity. And then get us ready to come back together as a church family on Sunday. 
And Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen.